So what we have learned about Romans is that the letter is divided into four uh, big sections and that each of the sections begins with um, diagnosing a certain kind of problem that relates to sin. And the first one, uh, the first problem related to the guilt of sin and the, the consequential wrath of God and then the corruption of sin uh, and how that leads to death and then Israel's disobedience and uh, how God responded with a partial hardening and then um, church division and the chastisement by God, uh, the master, uh, the Lord of the body of believers. And then, of course, each of these sections lay out a, ver a, a kind of salvation, a deliverance from these problems. And we notice that at the end of each of these sections, there's a statement about the glory of God. And uh, in the first half of the book, there's um, the end of section one in chapter five has a statement about the love of God, a couple of statements actually. And then in uh, chapter eight, at the end of the next section, a discussion of the love of God again. And then that switches at the ends of chapter, uh, or section three and four, chapter 11 and chapter 16 to the wisdom of God. And so the question we raised last time was, um, why is there a switch? Uh, why, why was it the love of God in the first part of the book and then it switches to the wisdom of God? Now, this is, this is a hard question. And the reason it's hard is simply because you're being asked to think about such large parts of the letter in order to answer the question. But one of the problems that we have when we're, when, they're, when we're reading and studying, thinking about Scripture, is we often think so microscopically that we forget to step back and think in these sort of macro ways. So it's one of the benefits of trying to really think about a question like this. But why, why, what is the relevance? Well, of these two virtues being changed in the, in the, from the first half of the book to the second half of the book. And what I'd like to suggest is that if you look at the first part of the book, the problems that relate to sin are what you might call personal problems. That is to say, it's a problem that each one of us individually share in. We are all of us individually, without exception, sinners, and we are all guilty sinners, and we all are corrupted by sin. So this is what you might call a personal, individual problem. Does it, is it true of universally? Yes, but it's a problem I have as much as you. Uh, some people, you know, in, in uh, your family or my family might be diagnosed with cancer. That doesn't mean I have cancer. It's a personal, individual problem. Even if everybody is diagnosed with cancer, we all have a personal, individual problem. When you come to the second half of the book, however, the problem of Israel's disobedience or of factions and divisiveness within the church are what uh, I think we can refer to as historical problems. They're problems that, um, that don't involve every individual, but are uh, problems that are um, accumulated and pile up and persist across many, many generations of people and become historical problems. So if those are the two different types of problems, then I suppose it's not, it somewhat makes sense that say with regard to the historical problems that Paul is thinking about how God's deliverance reveals his wisdom, the mind of God and how God has sovereignly, providentially uh, provided a relief, a deliverance across history uh, for these various problems. And whereas in the first half of the book, with regard to my own sin, my own guilt, my own corruption, God's personal love for me is the virtue that tends to stand out as being more um, prominent or fills up my horizon as I think about what God personally has done, what the Son of God personally did for me, or the Holy Spirit's personal indwelling in my life, within my soul, uh, does for me. So anyway, that's at least one, you may have come up with some other ideas, but that's at least one way to explain why there's a shift in the second half of the book. Now, what we're going to do for the final question about the whole of the book is ask 
without question, the most important uh, inquiry line of inquiry we can pursue. And that is, what is the book or the letter about? In one concise title or sentence, what would your answer be to the question, what is this book about? What is its major theme? Now, there's many, many different themes. What is the primary theme? What is it that explains why, uh, say, um, this part of the book, Israel's disobedience, is actually part of this letter? Why did Paul include that in this letter? Why did he include this part about church divisiveness? And how do these two things relate to the whole first half of the book and all these individual problems with sin? Why is all this packed into one letter, one treatise? Okay, And the, the goal is to come up with the most concise answer that you can deliver. One concise sentence. So best wishes and we'll see you next time.